today you're going to get my slideshow of my holiday. <laughs> How about that? Yeah, it's uh, Malcolm's trip. And Malcolm's trip, not Paul's j prison journey, that's right. <laughs> Malcolm's meanderings. Something like that. So uh, we're going to be talking about this with the title of Unhindered, and I'll have to explain that in just a moment, uh, why that is the case. But in Acts 28, that's where we are. And I'm looking for my reader today. I don't see my scripture reader. Oh, you are. Well, hang on one second. Not quite ready yet. I just didn't see you there. Great. Okay. Good stuff. So where are we? Uh, so just to give you a bit of context as to why I'm talking about Acts 28 today and showing you some of my holiday snaps, the reason is that Penny and I uh, were uh, on a journey with some friends of ours, including the aforementioned Douglas Jacobi, with about 30 people traveling part of the journey of the Apostle Paul as he made his way from initially J J Jerusalem and then to sort of Caesarea eventually all the way to Rome, where he was going to have an audience with Caesar himself. So we didn't do that whole journey in red on that slide, but we picked it up from uh, where he arrived on Malta, which I will explain in a moment. And let me just say this as we get into it. I'll show you some photographs and tell you some things about what we did. But the key thing here I'd like us to bear in mind are, are two things which we're going to talk about. One is <coughs> how inspiring the example of the Apostle Paul is. It's about Jesus and his inspiration of Paul that enabled Paul to endure some things that you and I would find very difficult to go through and hold on to our faith. And the second thing is in seeing Christ in him, or connected with that, seeing Christ in him, we see a way that we can be inspired to be Christ where we go just like Paul did. And then the second, the second main part of all this is to talk, to share with us all about the significance of the fact that even though we are often restricted in our talents, gifts, energy, time, money, we have our things that hinder us in life, no matter what those hindrances, the gospel is never hindered. It is always unhindered. And understanding that will help us a great deal. So that's where we are. So uh, we flew in on Air Malta a couple of weeks back now. And our first visit was to St. Paul's Bay. And uh, we are taking everything here from Acts 28, the last chapter of the book of Acts. And if you're familiar with the story, and if you're not, I'll summarize it. Paul is arrested. Uh, some Jewish people want him dead. He's held in custody in Caesarea in, uh, in Judea for at least two years. And eventually he says, well, uh, if I'm not going to get a, a fair trial here, I'm going to appeal to Caesar. And a Roman citizen could appeal to Caesar in, final, uh, in the final analysis. So he starts on a long journey to go there. And in Act 27, the captain of the ship he's on uh, foolishly goes to sea at a time when you don't go to sea, when it's very stormy that time of year. You don't sail for at least three months of that year. And there is a violent storm. And after two weeks... Um, Paul uh, uh, tells, uh, has, has a vision from God saying, none of you will die. Uh, there's 200 odd people on the boat and they run aground on a sandbar outside Malta. The ship breaks up and they all either swim onto their land or are carried or uh, cling onto bits of wreckage. And every soldier, every prisoner, every member of the crew lands on Malta. Um, it's in the middle of the night, it's dark. Uh, what the picture, photograph you're looking at there is a picture of what's now called St. Paul's Bay. And that's where they think Paul landed. There are actually three bays in that area. It could have been any of those three. This is maybe the most likely. Uh, and it, it's hard to imagine looking at this beautiful blue sky and the calm blue sea, what it was like. But it was very faith inspiring for me to stand there on that shore and think just further out to sea. The sandbars are further than you can see. The sandbars are there. They're still there today, though they shift around because of the currents, but they're still there. And uh, this thing that he ran aground there, the ship broke up, and in the middle of the night, in a storm, you're thrown into the water, and, and maybe they can see the land. We don't know, because it's not like there were bright lights in those days. Um, the current would have taken them into land, we know, because that's the way the currents work, and that's why they think that's the bay. So he would have been carried in, but terrifying. He, and it wasn't close to shore where this happened. It was quite some way out, further than I'm sure most of us could ever swim, even in an emergency. He's carried in to, uh, to shore, and uh, he and all his companions are saved. Quite, quite something. 
Uh, the islanders, it says, showed them unusual kindness, built a fire, welcomed them because it was raining and cold. And then it says, Paul gathered a pile of brushwood. And I love that image of Paul. He's soaking wet. He's gone through a terrifying ordeal. He's hungry as anything. They haven't eaten properly except one meal for two weeks. Thirsty. And the islanders welcome them. And what Paul does is rather than say, thanks very much, I could do with a, I could do with a cup of tea and, uh, and a piece of cake, please. I mean, I'm, I'm very tired. He's one of the ones that goes out to gather brushwood. Doesn't leave it to everybody else. Bear in mind, he's the, he's the chief prisoner here. He's the important guy, actually. But he gathers brushwood. He's, he's a servant everywhere he goes. That's how I see it anyway. So we uh, had some time there, and then we went to a place which is called Publius's house. In the story in Acts 28, uh, Publius is the chief official on the island. I think I mentioned some of this in the Watford Word, so I won't go into all the details now. He's the chief Roman official. He would have had the biggest house on the island. The biggest house so far on earth on the island of Malta is this house you're looking at here. These are the ruins. And they think this is where Publius lived. In fact, inside, they have beautiful mosaics still preserved. And uh, it is very likely that the Apostle Paul saw that mosaic, walked on that floor. And in that house, he healed Publius's father, who was ill. And again, the thing that Paul, again, on his important journey to Rome, was willing to heal a pagan. And we don't know the effects of that. And he prays before he, uh, before he heals him, which shows how his dependence on the Father, on God, for his healing powers, even though... There's no rule about praying before you heal. And we know that at times Jesus and other people healed people without there apparently being a specific prayer. But it says that Paul prayed, then went in and healed his father. Paul had an amazing power of healing, but he used it for indiscriminately for everybody. Not just for a few, not for people just he liked. Publius was a Roman official, one of those effectively responsible for his continued incarceration. But he heals his father. Paul was an amazing guy. It says in Acts 19, that extraordinary miracles were done through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. His hanky healed people. I mean, this, this is the Apostle Paul. I've actually brought one of my handkerchiefs today. Uh, and if you'd like to test it and see if it heals you. Uh, no, it's not, it's, not been, it's not been used. And no, it, it's a fresh one. It's not yet been used. But I have touched it and, you know, see if I've got some healing powers uh, or not. But I love the way that Paul is willing to serve in that way and praise and his dependence uh, on God that's important. We went next to Sicily and then on to the mainland of Italy. And one of the things that inspires me about Paul is there are three months on Malta. And then it says they got back in a, a ship that went to um, it, uh, an Alexandrian ship that went to Syracuse and stayed there three days on, on Sicily. This is the landing spot, they think where Paul landed on Sicily in Syracuse. And the thing that I love about this story about Paul here is that according to 2 Corinthians, he'd already been shipwrecked three times, <coughs> three times before this one. This is his fourth shipwreck. And he's still willing to get back in a boat. I mean, I don't know about you, the last thing I'd want to go anywhere near is a boat after these experiences. But he's willing to do that because he sees the hand of God. Sometimes we have to get back in the boat. Sometimes you have to get back on the horse, that expression, right? When you, so I love that about Paul. He's willing to do that, though it must have been so scary. And eventually he gets to Rome. That's the forum in Rome. And uh, he's chained to a soldier. It says there uh, he's allowed to live by himself in verse 16 with a soldier to guard him, which meant he was permanently chained to a soldier. Hopefully the chain wasn't too short, but he was permanently chained. And it's a, I love the image of Paul be, being chained, but not seeing that as a limitation. In Rome, he wrote letters, which we still read today and are inspiring. Uh, we'll read more later about his effectiveness. But there are no barriers to being spiritually useful to God. I see this in Paul. So what does Luke, the writer of, of, the, of Acts, want us to see? I would say a few things. Um, let me just uh, list these without going into detail. I think he wants to see Paul, us to see Paul as an ideal human disciple following Jesus. There's a lot of that in the book of Acts, but I think particularly in this chapter. One of the ways to learn how to be a disciple of Jesus is to look at people like Paul and ask, in what ways did they reflect Jesus? Then how can I reflect Jesus in the same or a similar way? And we see that even in this chapter. You remember back, you may know, earlier in the chapter, uh, when, when he's piling up the brushwood, uh, a viper attaches itself to Paul's hand. It bites him. And the islanders think, oh, he must be cursed because he's been rescued from the shipwreck, uh, but now uh, he's been bitten by the snake. So therefore, he must have a demon. He must be cursed. And then, of course, he shakes the, the, the snake off and he doesn't die. And then they say, oh, he must be a god. He must be a god. So they change their opinion. 
But what we see there, I think, is, is a, a reminder of the, uh, the snake in Eden, the serpent in Eden. We see, we, see, we see evil attempting to kill God's representative. But what we see is that now that Paul has the spirit of Christ in him, he is, he is safe from the, the evil snake representing evil. He's saved from it. And in shaking off the viper into the fire, it's a bit like, I think, the way that Jesus shakes off death, the evil of death by rising from the dead. Here is a man born out of the water, a new man with a new life, with a powerful life, a regenerated life, a life that cannot be uh, harmed by that which God refuses to let it be harmed. There are so many parallels with Jesus. And when he heals the father-in-law, um, he heals him in the same way that Jesus does. When Jesus goes in to heal Peter's mother-in-law, for example, uh, in Luke chapter 4, uh, we see the way that Jesus was unconventionally victorious, coming into Jerusalem as a king on a colt with blankets, not like a normal kind of king. Paul uh, is met by people who are from the church in Rome. They travel down to the three taverns and to, and to the... Um, to the three taverns in the form of Appius, which is quite some distance from Rome, they come down there to meet him and effectively escort him into Rome like a victorious emperor would be escorted. Only not exactly, obviously, like an emperor. An unconventionally victorious person, just like Jesus. And then we find that when the Jews come to speak to him when he's in Rome, um, they, they don't listen to what he has to say. Or at least most of them don't. Some do, but a lot of them say, no, we don't like this message. We don't want this. Uh, and so he is opposed by his own people, just like Jesus was opposed by his own people. And ultimately, we see, just like Jesus, his life was all about the good news. It wasn't about power. It wasn't about popularity. It wasn't about possessions and, and, or anything else. It was about the gospel. Similarly with Paul, a man with great privileges who studied under Gamaliel, who was a Roman citizen, who was very successful in many ways, and yet, for him, it was all about the gospel. If that meant being chained to a soldier in a jail or in a house uh, or, or shipwrecked or w whatever that meant, he was prepared for that because it was more about the gospel than anything else uh, in, in his life. So we see that uh, he is a representation uh, representative of Jesus. I would say this. If you want to give, ask for a definition of discipleship, there are many. I'll give you this one. Discipleship, following Jesus, is walking in the power of a Christ-given new life. Walking in the power of a Christ-given new life. What's our discipleship goal? It's to remind people of Jesus. Paul reminds us of Jesus in, Luke 20, in Acts 28. Our lives, if they represent Jesus accurately and fairly, will remind people of Jesus in different ways, but nonetheless. Let's not make the Christian life too complicated. Let's just do our best to be representatives of Jesus with this Christ-given new life everywhere we go. That will make a difference in this world. And secondly, the gospel is unhindered. Okay, now it's time for our reading. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God and from the law of Moses. And from the prophets, he tried to persuade them about Jesus. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. Thank you. Good reading, huh? He was in Rome, chained to that soldier, and allowed to have his own place to live. But uh, he had interesting um, house church, shall we say. Uh, all these people coming to him. They come to him one time, and they come back in even larger numbers, <laughs> witnessing to them from morning till evening. Maybe we should stick around here all day, shall we? <laughs> and pop across the road to the shop and get some refreshments, and uh, you know, we'll be all right. Uh, morning till evening, explaining the kingdom, the law of Moses, the prophets. He tried to persuade them. Think about this. I don't know about you, but I would think twice about listening to somebody and being persuaded by someone who I saw as a criminal who I saw in chains. Now, maybe I shouldn't be that prejudiced, but I would think twice. I would think, you're in chains. There's this Roman soldier sitting over there, probably bored out of his brain. If he's talking in Hebrew, he probably doesn't understand anything that's going on, right? So there's that Roman soldier just sitting there, chained. And there's Paul, who's only there because he's deemed to be a criminal by Jewish authorities in Jerusalem, and apparently by the Roman authorities. Why would you want to be persuaded by him? Why would you even listen? But Paul doesn't care how he's viewed because he knows the gospel is powerful in itself. He doesn't have to appear knowledgeable or clever or important or 
It doesn't matter how he looks, how he dresses. I mean, I don't know, how, how was his hygiene? I mean, I, I don't really know. How it, it doesn't matter to Paul because the gospel is unhindered. He tries to persuade them. Some were convinced, but others, unfortunately, uh, would not believe. This leads ultimately to the end of chapter 28. Let me just turn there, and if you'd like to uh, follow this with me. Uh, after this um, discussion, Paul quotes from Isaiah chapter 6, and in verse 26, uses that prophecy in Isaiah 6 to uh, apply it to the present situation he has, where go to this people and say, they'll be ever hearing, never understanding, ever seeing, never perceiving. Their hearts are calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, they closed their eyes. If they turned, I would heal them, but they're not turning to me. So he's, he's quoting Isaiah to say, you, you people are just like what was happening then. You've got hard hearts. You don't love the truth. I mean, God would be here, be here with you if you want, but you've got to turn to him. That's quite a challenging message. And then he says in verse 28, therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. That word hindrance right there, all boldness and without hindrance. So that leads us to this point, which is the literal translation of that verse. Now verse 31, if you just put the Greek words in order, says this, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and unhindered. Unhindered is the last word. It's the last word in the book of Acts. And it is the only time in the New Testament that that word is used. And when you look at things like that, they are not accidental. Luke chose that word as he wrote the book of Acts. He chose it deliberately and he placed it there, I'm sure, deliberately. Because the book of Acts is all about the spread of the gospel and how God is at work through the power of his spirit to achieve what Jesus said, that they will proclaim his message to Ju Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And as far as uh, the readers of the book of Acts will be concerned, Rome would be, from Jerusalem, the ends of the earth. That's where it's going to ultimately. Unhindered. It's a key word. It's a key thought. It's a key truth that the gospel is unhindered. The book of Acts ends with no resolution to Paul's personal problems. We believe he was in jail and did probably see Caesar, though it's not recorded. He was released. Two years later, he was rearrested, imprisoned in a more difficult circumstance, while Nero was the uh, emperor. And what do we know about Nero? Not, not, not a nice guy. <laughs> what else do we know? He set fire to Rome. For what reason? <clears throat> do we know why? He wanted a bigger palace. So he wanted to burn down a part of the, of the city where then they, he could build his nice palace, uh, which he built, and then he died just before it was finished. <laughs> and uh, we saw it on this trip. I won't show you photos now, but we did see it. It's now underground because it's been built on, and another emperor built a garden on top. They've excavated it now underneath. And I rather like the idea that, or the fact, that the sewers from the garden on top now flow into Nero's palace underneath. <laughs> Seems quite appropriate to me. Uh, a bit of, hubris, a bit of uh, what's the word? Justice? Uh, poetic justice will do. But yes, thank you very much. Anyway, that Nero was not a nice guy, no. And he, in that fire that he set off, it is uh, said that he set fire to Christians. So they were doused in, in like tar. There's a special kind of tar. And put on stakes and burned like torches. That was Nero. And under his emperorship, uh, both Paul and Peter were executed. That's a bit later than this, maybe two years later than what's being recorded uh, right here. So we don't know exactly what happened next, but we know where it, it all end, ends. The focus of Luke's account here is to keep the focus on the gospel more than Paul even. The gospel is unhindered. He's teaching with all boldness and unhindered. The kingdom of God is unhindered. Let me ask you a question, which you can just answer for yourself and think about maybe, maybe it's something to pray about and, and talk about. What is it that we assume or think that makes us feel like the gospel has, it can, like it can be hindered? What, what gets it, at least in our minds, what gets in the way of us 
feeling confident and able to take the gospel to other people? What gets in the way, at least in our minds? The common things I think that we would think of is our jobs. Our jobs take a lot of time, a lot of energy. Uh, it seems now with um, the economic situation, we're you know, more concerned, obviously, to hold on to our jobs and not do anything that might jeopardize them. And maybe we work harder, work longer, work. But do our jobs, do we see our jobs as getting in the way? Or perhaps um, our health. Our health gets in the way. Our health isn't what, what we would like it to be. Our energy levels, our mobility, um, various challenges that we have uh, with health. We think that's what might hinder the gospel. A lack of knowledge. We think we don't know enough. If I, if I knew everything in the Bible, I'd be more confident. I'm not sure you would, but do we think a lack of knowledge? A lack of English is our first language. Do we think that might be a hindrance to the spread of the gospel? Or maybe um, children, if I may put this the right way, we love our children, but they do keep us busy. And we see that as something that hinders our ability to, uh, to the gospel going to, to more and more people. My thought would be, as we reflect on whatever we comes to our minds, is to flip that round and to see those very challenges as the opportunities for God to take the gospel there. Your workplace, why not? Why not that as a fertile land for the gospel? Your family, your children, or the people your children are connected to. Why not that as a fertile ground for the gospel? Uh, our health challenges means we often come into contact with health professionals and other people, carers. Maybe that is fertile ground. If English isn't the first language, then there may be some other people we want, we're together with learning a language, and that could be a channel for the gospel. There are so many different ways that can be done, but God can use these apparent hindrances to be the actual channel for the gospel. I'll come back to something in a moment, but let me just share with you uh, this verse in Philippians 4, verse 22. Paul, writing from prison, says, All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. We don't know exactly where Paul was when he wrote Philippians. He doesn't say. It could have been Ephesus. He was in jail there. Uh, it could have been Rome. Most likely Rome. Most people think it's Rome. It might have been this imprisonment. might have been the next one. But nonetheless, even though he's imprisoned, somehow his connection with Caesar's household is bearing fruit, which means it's most likely Rome. It doesn't necessarily mean it was Caesar's relatives. It could have been some of his slaves and officials. But nonetheless, people of Caesar's... I mean, just think about that. How are we going to get the gospel to Caesar? Well, you're going to be shipwrecked and go to prison, Paul. No, 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 that doesn't sound like the right way. But it was the right way. Maybe it was the only way. Paul had to be willing for it to be the way. He had to cooperate. That's the challenge, isn't it? To, to cooperate with the way that God is using you and I to channel the gospel to people. It may not be the way you want. Maybe rather uncomfortable. I'm so inspired by Paul. He, um, this is where they think he was imprisoned the second time in AD 64. It's a dungeon underground. It's, down, it's quite a long way down underground. There's no light. It may not have been there, but it's quite likely, and it definitely was a first century jail. That is for sure. That's where they held prisoners, and they wouldn't have had very many. Uh, because you didn't keep prisoners in jail much. Um, you kept them in their own homes, which is what's happening in Acts 28. But the second time around, Paul was actually in a jail. And this is the kind of place, dark, unsanitary, horrible. I mean, it's hard to get a feeling of how oppressive that is on a photograph. But he was willing. And there's a church in Rome uh, dedicated to the Apostle Paul where it is said he's buried. Uh, there's a reasonably good chance it is where he's buried. Uh, what you're looking at there through the grating is the side of a sarcophagus where it is believed Paul's bones are contained. There's an altar built over the top. They discovered this. It was hidden for many years, but they discovered it. I don't know when. Uh, it, it is, there's a good chance. There's a very good chance that Peter's bones are under St. Peter's Basilica in, in Rome. It's quite, it's very likely he certainly was killed there. And even if it's not exactly there, but that did, he did, he did end his life in Rome. 
He was willing, just like Jesus. My life is yours, Jesus. The gospel can go the way you want it to. I just share finally, uh, before we take communion, about the most moving part of the trip to me. The, this is the Colosseum in Rome, as you may recognize it. It's a magnificent um, structure. And I was there in last in 1983. And I was standing, let me see. I don't know if you can see that green dot, but I was, I was standing just there where those two people are in 1983. And I was a man of Christian faith and I read my Bible and I prayed regularly, but I knew something was missing. And I'd been praying to find a way to get the strength of faith that I felt I needed. And I stood there, I looked across where the floor of the Colosseum used to be, and you can see now where they held the animals underneath, the slaves, the prisoners, the gladiators, and those who would come up and be fed to the lions, including Christians. They were held down there. And I was imagine, standing there imagining being one of the people in those places of captivity, hearing the roar of the crowd, knowing that I would soon be dead because I was a Christian and waiting to be brought up to face whatever fate I was going to endure. And as I stood there, I thought, I, I am so far from this. I believe in God, but I, 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 can't, I can't even imagine myself being in a place where I could do this. I felt very, I really need you, God, but where are you? I don't have enough of you. And I prayed that day that somebody would come into my life and show me how I could be a man of faith. Maybe I couldn't do that. I don't know today whether I could. I don't really know, do I? But I needed someone to show me. And I was, and Penny was with me. Uh, we were boyfriend and girlfriend then. And we both prayed about that. And a year later, almost exactly a year later, I ended up in London for a new job, met members of the church that I'm now with, who opened the Bible with me and showed me what it meant to be a disciple. Something, someone living in the power of a Christ-given new life. And to go back there almost 40 years later and stand in the same spot reminded me of the grace and the love of God. But those who reach out for him will find him. And they are everywhere. Everywhere. They're out there right now. They're next door to where we live. They're in on the next, sitting on the next desk from where we work. They're, they're the parents of some of our children's friends. They're everywhere. And maybe we just need to believe that the gospel is unhindered. As it truly always is. And you may say, but I'm unworthy. And I guess we could all say, Amen. We're all unworthy, right? Sure, we're unworthy. But going back to that passage in Isaiah, just before the one that Paul quotes, is this. Isaiah says, I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. I can't go to your people. He's being commissioned to go. I live among a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the king. Oh, my goodness, he's in trouble. And one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand. He'd taken with tongs from the altar. He touched my mouth and said... See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Therefore, you can go. Not because you're worthy, but because I have cleansed you. You can go. You have permission to go. And what Christ has done on the cross has given us the same, the same ability, the same permission, the same privilege, because we are not worthy, but Christ has touched us. He has taken our sins away. They are atoned for. Therefore, we can go. This week, maybe today, I might take some time to pray about this and ask God to reveal to you and I, for us all, where am I hindered? And may that be the exact place where the gospel can go, because the gospel 
is always on hand. Uh, someone's going to pray for us now before we take bread and wine. 